Um, I'm Anne Marie Lipinski. I am the curator of the Neiman Foundation for Journalism here at Harvard. And uh, on behalf of my colleagues there and our partners at Harvard Writers at Work, we're really excited to welcome you all today and um, to uh, share uh, Susan uh, with you this afternoon. Um, Susan, uh, who I've known since we were both in college, um, and uh, who was also a Neiman Fellow in the class of 2004. And as we say, there are no former Neiman Fellows, so our Neiman Fellow, Susan Orlean. And uh, she'll be interviewed this afternoon by, um, or in conversation with, uh, Kim Tingley, who's a Neiman Fellow in the current, uh, in the current class. Um, Kim is a contributing writer to the New York Times Magazine, uh, has written for The New Yorker and many other places, and is studying the history of science um, here at, uh, at Harvard uh, this year. So the, the two of them will talk um, with each other uh, about uh, uh, the writing life and Susan's work. And then um, uh, the last uh, bit of the afternoon, we'll, um, we'll open it up to your questions. So please join me in welcoming Susan and Kim. Um, most of you probably know who Susan Orlean is, but I'm going to tell you anyway again. <laughs> um, Susan's a longtime staff writer at The New Yorker and the author of eight books, including The Orchid Thief, which became the film adaptation um, in which the part of Susan Orlean is played by Meryl Streep. Um, she's also written Rin Tin Tin, and she's at work now on a book about the LA Public Library. Um, one problem for anybody uh, introducing her turns out to be that she herself is a master of the introduction. Um, the first sentences of her pieces are declarative, authoritative, and often absurd all at the same time. Um, and they sort of dare you not to read the next sentence. So um, instead of introducing her any further, I'm going to sort of let a couple of her sentences, uh, introduce her for her, and then we'll chat. Um, so I'm just going to read them in quick succession like a weird prose poem. <laughs> um, <laughs> the Maui surfer girls love one another's hair. Of all the guys who are standing around bus shelters in Manhattan dressed in nothing but their underpants, Marky Mark is undeniably the most polite. <laughs> One of the last happy meetings of the Tanya Harding fan club took place at Nancy Wellfelt's house around her dining room table. In Bulgaria, some tennis balls are like dumplings. <laughs> For a while, Silly Billy was of the mind that all clowns were fungible. If Colin Duffy and I were to get married, we would have matching superhero notebooks. If I were a bitch, I'd be in love with Biff Truesdale, <laughs> who is a dog. <laughs> um, so I thought maybe we could start out by talking a little bit about um, process and just, you know, first sentences. Is For you, when you start writing, does the first sentence have to come first, and does it have to be right before you can move on to anything else? Or how does that work for you? Um, it's funny. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm still <laughs> laughing over these, thinking, really? Did I write those? <laughs> um, for better or worse, I, I write from the beginning to the end yeah. in stories. And as a result, I can't move forward until I get that first sentence down. I think partly it's um, I'm writing the way a reader would experience the piece. Um, it, it, as a result, my entry into the piece is replicating what the reader is going to experience. So it feels natural to me that I'm, I'm kind of building the story the way it will be read. Um, it's also a matter of tonally getting, finding myself before I continue writing. And it, it would be very odd, even though I envy people who can sort of write the blocks of text, then store them and assemble it like a Lego when they have all of these pieces. I, I just can't do that. And I realize that the model that maybe makes more sense for me is oral storytelling. Um, you would, while you might think in advance of anecdotes that you're going to tell in the course of, of telling a story, 
when you are telling a story, you begin at the beginning and you build and there's a lot of rhythm, there's a lot of, of subconscious process going into keeping people engaged and listening. It seems to me you can't do that unless you do it in order, or at least I should say I can't do it unless I do it in that order, modeling as if I were telling the story out loud and counting on all of the, the rhythmic propulsion that would come in, in telling a story out loud. And so when you're sort of going from, you know, your reporting notebooks to your writing desk, which is a walking desk, we should say, you're not, but when you, when you stand up to write your first sentence, you know. <laughs> when I'm or, running. Yeah, as, as I'm you're jogging to get to that yeah. first sentence. Um, do you, have, have you practiced telling it out loud? Like how do you, do, do you have an outline? Like sort of what are the bare bones of that process like for you? Um, well, definitely, well, let me begin with just the, the sort of, actual kind of walk you through. Yeah. Um, and I have a couple of important points that are my little hobby horses, which I will note. To begin with, I, I do all my reporting before I begin writing. And certainly there are times where you have to go back and do infill reporting because you discover something you didn't learn well enough. But I'm doing all the reporting in advance. I take notes by hand. And just as an aside, and you as a person who knows science, I'm sure are familiar with all of the studies that have shown that you absorb information very differently if you take it by hand, as opposed to the worst, which is a tape recorder, mm -hmm. and second worst is typing. So um, I've handwritten these notes. I then once I've done all the reporting, I type up all the notes. So it's sort of a second time of interacting with the material. Then I print it all out and highlight the notes, the sections of the notes that seem particularly useful for me. So it's sort of a third time of having contact with that information. At that point, I generally find myself talking the story out, out loud, either with just casually when people say, what are you working on? And you know, then it's like, ugh, bar the door, I'm gonna just talk. Um, or I take advantage of my husband's enormous <laughs> patience and talk out the story. And to me, it's incredibly important. It's the, I begin hearing the, the themes, I begin hearing what has risen out of that reporting and stuck in my head as being interesting or, or relevant or important. And the less important stuff starts sort of being shed. So once I've gone through that, I then start just percolating. And it will be a moment where I suddenly hear a lead in my head. And as you say, a lot of these are a bit absurd. I don't feel that a lead needs to be a synopsis of the story. And in fact, I think it's a huge mistake for it to be that. Instead, I, I like to think of it as a, as a come hither look. It's, it's something <laughs> um, inviting, uh, tempting, a little off kilter. So you think, well, wait, 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 wait. I have to understand this. Right. I have to keep reading because I don't understand quite understand what I've just read. It's useful if it has some information, though that doesn't seem so important <laughs> to me. Um, and, you know, I really uh, compare it to a, a striptease. Y you want to take off just enough to have people say, wait, I, I got to stick around and right. see what this is all about. Right. Not to be bewildering, but to be engaging and, you know, sometimes it's meant to be funny. Funny in a way that both makes you laugh but also makes you curious. And, and to me that's the, the essential fact of these stories, which is I enter them because I'm curious. I then have to make a reader share that same sense of curiosity, particularly because most of these stories are not urgent. No one has to read them. 
They're not breaking news. They're, they don't feel essential. So what I have to say is what's essential is that I'm going to make you curious, and you're going to want to engage in this story the way I did, which is I'm just wondering, how, what's this all about? Whether it's the interior life of a 10-year-old boy, whether it's uh, what's it like to be a children's party clown, what's the backstory of this dog character that I thought was just a TV show and turns out to have a 100-year history. It's that sense of, I want to know, I'm curious, what's this about? And I need to make the reader feel that as well. And so when you approach um, like a piece, for instance, about you know the average 10-year-old boy, do you think in the back of your mind, like somehow I have to transcend the subject and it has to be about you know something bigger? Or do you approach it like very sort of earnestly, like this is a story about a 10-year-old boy, and then if anything else, you know, how do you sort of negotiate, like, making, because I think that piece is a great example of something that is seemingly extremely ordinary, but in this, you know, in the specificity of the details about this 10-year-old boy, we start to think, like, what is the meaning of us, be, you know, are we doing anything more important than, like, wrapping fishing line around right. our backyard? You know, it, like, gets to, it gets you to a bigger place, but I just yeah. kind of wondered, maybe, um, I know a bunch of the Neemans have read that, I thought maybe we could talk a little bit about, kind of, how you approach that piece and that subject. Yeah, oh, well, let me give you a little bit of background on the story, just um, because it has an, a peculiar origin. And it's a good, in terms of sort of illustrating the way that I've kind of conducted my career, it's probably a, a good example. Um, but it does have a funny backstory, <laughs> which is, um, I was approached by the editor-in-chief at Esquire and who said, we're doing a big package, this issue, it's the American man, and we're going to have the American man at various ages, and would you like to do the American man age 10, and the, we've already chosen the American man age 10, and it's Macaulay Culkin, the actor. <laughs> and, I had never written for Esquire, so my first reaction was, oh my god, I'm being offered an assignment for Esquire. And then the second overriding impulse, which I still can't believe I had the nerve, but I just thought, but I don't want to write about Macaulay Culkin. I mean, who cares about Macaulay Culkin? For a couple of reasons. One is, having done celebrity profiles, I knew that you never really get beyond, particularly with a kid, you would never get beyond what the celebrity has decided to deliver to you. Mm -hmm. And in the case of a kid, there would be a handler there the whole time. And you know, I just thought, I don't want to do that story. But also, I thought, I honestly, Macaulay Culkin is a one-off. Most 10-year-olds do not have a driver and an agent. And <laughs> there was a moment where I thought, you know, I've never thought about this before, but what is it like to be a 10-year-old boy? I had no idea. I didn't have kids at the time. I, I had no clue. And I thought, oh my god, I'm so curious about that. And I said to my editor at Esquire, I'd love to do the story, but I, can I just pick an average boy? And credit to Esquire for saying yes, because this, what could be less marketable right. than <laughs> a profile of an <laughs> average suburban kid? Ten-year-old, yeah. And First of all, I didn't know any 10-year-old boys, so there was a first issue, which is how I would <laughs> find one. And vet him for you. And, you know, I, I would call my friends and say, do you know any 10-year-old boys? And there was like this long silence, I like, why? Um, secondly, I was living in Manhattan, and I did not want a boy in Manhattan, because I felt that that is a very particular childhood. And I was trying to find something that was, you know, there is no typical, but at least some, an example of a childhood that would be fairly familiar to a lot of people. And through asking enough friends who, if they knew 10-year-old boys, I eventually was introduced to this kid who lived in, in Glen Ridge, New Jersey, 
whose parents were um, really wonderful, and they said, if he wants to do it, that's fine. Um, this young man, Colin Duffy, said, yeah, sure, whatever, which I now <laughs> understand is the classic response from a 10-year-old right. boy. <laughs> Um, and just as an aside, I have to tell you, because there was this, you know, I've never done war reporting, but I would say this counts as combat duty because I showed up. My plan was, I'm just going to shadow this kid for a week. I'm going to go to school with him. I'm going to just spend day and night with him and then write a story. I showed up Monday morning, and I think it suddenly dawned on him <laughs> that an adult female was going to accompany him to school. And he, I think, had that, like, oh my god, this is too weird. And he shunned me. <laughs> he totally shunned me. I mean, I remember following him to school. It was cla I was like 10 paces behind him, sort of walking like this. And so he was totally uncomfortable and embarrassed and sort of baffled, like, what are you doing here? And I got to his classroom and had to like squish myself into those little chairs. Yeah. And he wouldn't talk to me. <laughs> and this was a great moment for me in a lot of ways, because it, besides being absolutely sort of staggered by the impossibility of my task, I also had the crisis of faith that's very, I have to say, common to every story I've ever done, which is to think, why would anyone care about this story? Who cares? He's a typical 10-year-old boy in the suburbs. Why would anyone care? And it's a really uncomfortable place from which I have to sort of claw out of, because the reality is you can make the argument that no, no one cares. It's not a celebrity. It's not breaking news. It's not a matter of urgency. But the other part of me believes that, that is it's a mission that is important for writers, which is to look at what we call ordinary life, which I'm always a little uncomfortable using that term, but the fact is to look at the commonplace, to look at what's right in front of us that we've never really examined or considered, or you know, we assume we know, but we don't. And that there's an enormous value to it, but it, it takes, there's a kind of confidence that can be really you know, I can lose at some point. It's a lot easier to profile a celebrity, believe me, because it's a guarantee you know people want to know how Macaulay Culkin spends his day. I mean, that's human nature. Right. It's a lot harder to say to people, this is a totally ordinary kid. This could be the kid who lives next door to you, and for some reason I'm asking you to spend an hour reading this story. So how did you break through with Colin with Duffy? Yeah. <laughs> well, day one, no luck at all. I mean, and every kid in his class was looking at me like, ew, what is she doing here? And he was like, oh, I have nothing to do with her. I don't know who she is. And I, you know, I followed him home, all still my heart in my mouth, thinking, what, what was so wrong with Macaulay Culkin? <laughs> right. Like, what? <laughs> um, second day showed up. Again, he was completely shunning me. Got to school, I sat there, and I think the horror and terror <laughs> that I was feeling was plain. Yeah. And I think he felt a little sorry for me. I also think, and I discovered this because my, my method of reporting is to just be there. Mm -hmm. And I don't usually come asking lots of questions, I, I sit there. And eventually, people often will come to me, and I think they think, what is this person doing here? We take pity on you, and we're going to now help you. <laughs> um, I remember some years ago, I did a story about life in a trailer park. And I just sat in the front office of this trailer park for a couple of days, and at one point, the woman running the trailer park said to me, you're a quiet little thing, aren't you? And I thought, well, that's I'm not. But in that setting, 
I definitely was. And what was interesting is, you know, in a way I almost feel like it's uh, inadvertently a really good technique, which is that this 10-year-old boy then thought, oh my God, this poor person looks so lost and she has no clue of what's going on. I will help her out. And he said to me at the end of that second day, um, do you want to come over after school and I can show you my room? Oh, classic. Yeah. And I thought, <laughs> yes. <laughs> and then, I, from then on, I think he thought, she's just like another 10-year-old boy, but just a little bigger, and she has a car. And so I was like golden yeah. at that point. Um, but it was, it, it was not an easy process. And writing about kids is definitely different from writing about adults. I so often write about people who have never been written about before. And that's a very different, and, and also people who have nothing to gain by it. Yeah. So there's a, a, a very different process involved. And as I said, and I'm being really genuine here, there's never been a story that I worked on that at some point I didn't think, I don't understand why I'm doing this. I don't understand why anyone would want to read this. It, it's not important. It's not urgent. And I have to really fight that because, you know, that, that's both true, but also at the same time not true. Right. Have you ever had a story just crash and burn that you couldn't, you know, that you couldn't get to work uh, for? Yeah, um, but not so much for the reason of thinking this is too ordinary. Mm -hmm. I've never done a piece where midway through I thought this is, this falls even below the or lean low bar <laughs> of, <laughs> or, <laughs> of important. Yes. Um, I've had pieces where, um, I felt people were a little too, they were trying to manage the piece mm -hmm. and, and I didn't feel comfortable with our rapport. Yeah. And I've had some pieces, actually, I can think more of pieces where the reporting fell apart and I stuck with it. Mm -hmm. um, and in some cases, the, the story of the story falling apart became interesting. The title story for my first collection, The Bullfighter Checks Her Makeup, was one of those examples where I was asked to profile Christina Sanchez, who was um, a female matador and in Spain, and she was a very big deal at the time. And I was dealing with her manager before I went to Spain. And I arrived in Spain only to discover that this guy wasn't her manager, and he had basically scammed <laughs> me. And I was ready to get on the next plane and go home. And in fact, the photographer did leave. He just said, well, I'm out of here. And he left. And my editor said, just try, stay there and figure out. And actually, then she asked a really important question, which is, why would someone pretend to be her manager? Is she so, is she such a significant figure now that you've got this sort of secondary economy of, pe of people right. pretending to be her manager? Um, and similarly with my piece, uh, The Surf Girls of Maui, that story totally <laughs> fell apart and it's always when you travel somewhere like really nice and right. you also they've are already thinking, spent a lot of money on you. They've spent money, and, and yes. I mean that was very much the case with both these stories. I arrive in Maui to profile these girl surfers, and everyone I called said, "Nah, I'm not into surfing anymore." And I thought, "Thanks, thank you. I'm now. What do I do?" And I was ready to leave, and my edit. I called one last girl. And she said, well, the girls you were calling are the wrong girls. I'll introduce you to all the girls who surf here. And so it was, it turned out well. But it, it was a great, um, just, you know, so often stories, and actually I think in a good way, stories change. You have an idea of what it's going to be. and. I sometimes think it's not a good thing if it doesn't change while you're reporting, because then you're, you haven't really opened yourself 
to the real story. Well, let me ask you about, um, it seemed to me like the orchid thief might be another example of this sort of where you go in, um, for people who haven't read it, it's um, the orchid thief is nominally, um, what would you call him? <laughs> John LaRoche is a, sort of a hustler, yeah. right? Like a spy, and so um, he's, he wants to steal these orchids from the Fakahatchee in Florida, um, and he has a plan that he's gonna make millions of dollars, and he's sort of orchid obsessed, but in the course of your reporting about him, there's often times where you know, you're know you calling him, and he's not, he's like the quintessential unreliable character yes. to the point where, he decides sort of two thirds of the way through the book that he doesn't care about orchids anymore and that's it. Like he's done right. with orchids. He's gonna be a computer analyst or something. Right. Um, so I just kind of wondered if you could talk about, you know, I think then the book ends up being more about your obsession with, you know, him and people's obsessions in general, but right. did you have to go through kind of a whole, process of rethinking, I was wondering, as you, you know, you come to do it about him and that sort of takes yeah. a turn. Well, uh, to sort of reiterate what I just said, I think that, first of all, I tend to write about things I know nothing about, and that's why I'm interested in writing about them. I don't like to over-prepare before I begin doing my reporting. I'd rather immerse myself in the world and, and let it unfold. And that in, inevitably means that things are not neat and they don't follow the comfortable path that you would expect, and nor should they. Um, I think that, you know, I'll give you an example of when I first started as a, as a you know, my very early days as a journalist and I was doing a little bit of work for Newsweek. And they had asked me, they said, we're doing a story about um, kids, um, I'm trying to remember what, oh, about kids ratting on other kids for using drugs. We have a story that we're gonna do. This is a trend. And I found a girl and actually it was a much more interesting story. I mean, she had ratted out a friend and then it turned out that actually they were competing drug dealers. And, you know, so it was sort of a he said, or she said, she said, and it was a very complex, interesting story. And you can, I can promise you, Newsweek said, oh, doesn't fit. Our trend that we have declared is that kids are turning in other kids for dealing drugs. And I thought, well, that may be the case, but this is not, this is actually a really interesting story that doesn't fit your trend. And, you know, I've done a lot of, you know, when I first started writing, I wrote a lot for a lot of women's magazines, and often they'd say, you know, tube tops are in. And you would say, okay, and they'd say, find us a few people who can give you a quote about tube tops being in. And then you might encounter someone and say, well, oh, I don't think they're in. They say, well, we're not using that quote. <laughs> we want more of the tube tops are in. So it's that, and, and I think it's a terrible tendency to make a decision in an office somewhere that there is a particular truth, and then you plug in examples to support it. I mean, what could be less real? Now, I'm not doing trend pieces, I'm not, you know, obviously this is a very different kind of reporting, but the, I mean, the fact is you enter a story, and part of why I think nonfiction is so interesting is that unlike fiction where you make a decision about where the story is gonna go, you don't make a decision where the story is gonna go, you end up with the set of facts and set of people and there's always logic, because life is logical. It may just not be the story you had in mind. So John LaRoche, you know, midway through my reporting, says, I'm done with orchids. I got rid of all my orchids. I'm not, I have nothing to do with them anymore. And I was like, you're ruining my book. Right. <laughs> and then suddenly it occurred to me, well, no, this makes perfect sense. That's who he is. And then, weirdly enough, the book actually came alive around that realization that this was about these serial passions 
that he engaged in and abandoned. And that, yeah, it was about orchids. It was about this particular case. It was you know, about the world I encountered there. But in terms of this thematic truth, that was much more real, first of all, because it was real, but also because it became much more interesting to me, where I, at the end of the book, suddenly thought, even though initially I was thinking, this is so strange, and how could you give up on something that you've been so passionate about, the realization that, well, this is actually what a journalist does. This is really very much the, the blueprint of my own life, that I throw myself into stories, and then I'm done. And it, so it became actually much deeper and more interesting to me. It struck me at that you know it's much easier, or seemingly much easier, to report a story, as you're saying, if you have kind of an idea of what the story, you know, it's about tube tops are awesome, and then you go report that. But then, how do you approach reporting a story if, you know, in this case, as you sort of start to realize that it's not maybe going to turn out how you think. It's not going to be about this particular guy. And you were, maybe, I wonder if you can tell us a little bit about um, how you, you know, you were down there for two years reporting. And how, how did you decide sort of what to look for, you know, in the absence of an obvious, you know, centerpiece? Like, how did you, like, decide what you were going to do that day when you woke up in the morning? <laughs> uh, that's a, actually a, a very relevant question, because there were times when I'd wake up and think, I, I don't know what to do. I don't know how I'm supposed to be figuring out this story. Um, and very often, what I, the way I look at it, and, and this helps me in that sort of existential crisis of thinking, what am I, how am I coming to understand this story? I really look at this process as having two distinct components. One is the reporting stage where I'm a student. And like any student, my task is just to learn. So I'm writing a story about John LaRoche. I need to learn about Florida and Florida history. I need to learn about orchids. I need to learn about his life story. It's I need an education on all of the components of the story. And so even though I wake up in the morning and there's no particular event to follow, that day I can think to myself, I need, OK, I'm going to go. I need to learn more about the Seminoles because they're important in this story. So I'm going to go to the reservation and just wander, talk to people, learn. Um, the second part of the process is where I become a teacher. And I take everything I learned as a student and try to synthesize it and teach the reader about what I learned. And that involves selecting. But during the reporting, I just feel like I need, you know, so much of it never ends up in the book because it's never meant to end up in the book. But I feel like I can't write about going to the Seminole Roundup unless I've done a lot of homework already to learn about the background of the Seminoles in, in Florida. And you know, while I'm doing that background, I, I'm never quite sure. And there are times where I think, why am I doing this? Um, but it's, it's to educate myself so that at the end of the day, I could tell you the whole book coming from real knowledge and not off of notes. So. In terms of you know your reporting, you're you're going down for a long time. You're becoming involved with your subjects. You stay with them for you know weeks or months or even years. In the case of you know certain um, subjects like Laroche, how do you negotiate? It seems like there's you know there's you, the real person reporter, and then there's the character of you that appears in the story, and then there's also the you that sort of the narrator of the, the larger story. How do you decide how much of you belongs in the, in the piece and in what, you know, sort of what your role is going to be you know, as a character, I guess? Um, that's always a, a challenging part of the process. And 
I was thinking about this today because you and I had um, talked a little bit about touching on this. And I was thinking about the, the story that sort of liberated me in this regard, which was um, some years ago, one day, I mean, this is, makes me sound like I'm such an oddball, but this is sort of the way it works for me. I was in a grocery store. And I suddenly thought, oh my god, grocery stores, they're so amazing. Like, <laughs> how do they work? How do they work? I mean, this is just amazing. How do they get the stuff in? And how do they decide what to have in there? And you know, I just was sort of overwhelmed, thinking this is the most interesting thing I've ever thought of in my life. And uh, by the way, just as an aside, this was a Manhattan grocery store. where. It, it, which involves many more challenges. But I went to the manager and I said, Can I, I'd love to write a story about you know, a week in the life of your grocery store. And then he said to me, he said, I can't let you be in here because we do a lot of Santeria rituals in the store. <laughs> and I thought, did, did I just hear that? And, and he said, so no, I'm sorry, no press. And I thought, what? You can't do this to me. This is horrible. But anyway, he wouldn't let me. And I still haven't gotten the answer to what the Santeria rituals were. Yeah. But I then thought, my god, I, I really want to do this story. And I made the decision, instead of doing a Manhattan grocery store, to go to Jackson Heights, which was then the most ethnically diverse community in the entire country. Because I thought, this is so interesting, because grocery stores are the ultimate common denominator. Everybody goes to the grocery store. And in a community that's so diverse, what does that mean? Um, and I, any, I ended up spending about six weeks going kind of every day and hanging out in this grocery store and talking to everybody who worked there and the owner, and it was really fun. It was really interesting. When I sat down to write the piece, I was suddenly um, realizing that there was this challenging structural issue, which is that grocery stores are like little nation states. And you've got the butchers, and you've got the cashiers, and you've got all of these components. And the common um, perspective was me. Mm -hmm. I was the one who was sort of rotating among these different little universes. And it felt very artificial to me to write this story with the omniscient narrator. Right. It just felt so um, unnatural and, and also inauthentic because it just felt so stilted. And, and the fact is, I was the I was the narrator, and it made sense to simply acknowledge me in as the person, almost like I'm walking around with the camera. It's not that I'm in front of the camera, but you're aware that I'm the one holding the camera. And suddenly, writing with that transparency felt really natural to me. And the story was not in any way about me. Though I could pull myself in for comic relief when I needed it. Um, and I don't mind making fun of myself in, in the, you know, it's sometimes fun just to sort of walk myself into a scene and, you know, provide a little humor in that regard. But in terms of the perspective, it just felt natural. Again, to, you know, go back to this idea of the oral tradition. If you're telling a story to people about an interesting thing you observed, you would never tell it in the voice of an omniscient narrator. You would tell it through your perspective, not that it's about you, but that you're simply comfortably accepting that it is being told with a subjective view. And in a way, I feel like that also permits you to acknowledge the limits of your reporting. Mm -hmm. yeah. That you, there is no reporting that can be entirely objective, entirely comprehensive. That 
you know, you can strive for it. And certainly in newspaper reporting and certain reporting, it's important to strive for it. In, but in the case of these stories, it's more important, I think, to be honest. And in that way, you can also acknowledge where you are not able to know everything. And also how you are changing maybe the environment right. that you've entered into yeah, unavoidably. I mean, yeah. To go back to the 10-year-old, um, the story about the 10-year-old, the fact is there was no question that having an adult in his presence for whom he was showing off some of the time, where I was asking him questions about the world. I mean, it changed. It was not that there was a hidden camera. Right. It was a 10-year-old boy interacting with an adult, but an adult who was not a typical, you know, I wasn't an authority figure, I wasn't a parent, I wasn't a teacher. But it seemed to me that it was, it was simply dishonest to not make it very apparent to the reader that this was very much the product of me being with him. And you know, some of it was just funny because he's shooting you with a slingshot. Yeah, and, yeah. <laughs> and they started torturing me. And it was like I had to stand there. And well, um, what Kim is referring to is that there was some point where they, the, the boy I was writing about and a friend of his had slingshots. And they suddenly thought, oh, this would be fun if they took kibble that they feed their dog and load it in a <laughs> slingshot. And even more fun if they shot it at me. Right. And it was hilarious. I mean, it was also probably heaven for them yeah. to think they're shooting at an adult who's not, they're not going to get in trouble. Right. So the, I mean, to me, what's always important is to be honest with the reader. And that involves acknowledging limitation. And, and as a result, being present in the story feels authentic mm -hmm. to me. And then coming in on, on occasion as a character who's interacting and there's some, often some amount of humor or, or revelation in being present. At the same time, um, you know, keeping, monitoring that because these are not memoir. Right, right. And yet this is my experience. Um, I was just thinking today, uh, you know, I'm writing this book about the LA Public Library and it came about in part because I was new to LA. And it suddenly dawned on me that, of course, the book will have to, I mean, will very appropriately acknowledge that this was in part an outgrowth of me learning my way around a new city mm -hmm. and learning the history of a new city. And that, that seems like that makes sense that it shouldn't that doesn't get in in the way of the story but by way of enriching it and and probably having a more intimate voice with the reader it makes sense to make that apparent do you um you know you mentioned going to a place that you you know don't know well and it, it strikes me that your your stories are so all over the map in terms of subject that you you're often in a situation where you're parachuting into an unfamiliar you know, topic or environment and then sort of needing to become an expert in that area in order to write this right. piece. Do you have, I'm always thinking like when that happens, I'm always worried that there's some like basement room that I've completely failed to see that is gonna you know, be revealed to me as soon as I publish this story claiming to be an authority on the subject of whatever. Right. Do you worry about that and do you have ways of guarding against that and has that actually ever you know, happened that you found something in the basement that you didn't well, I hope definitely, was there? Well, I definitely <laughs> worry about it and um, every topic that I write about, there are people who are experts on that topic. And um, I knew, for instance, when I was writing The Orchid Thief, that the people who were going to grab the book first were orchid fanatics, and they were going to make my life miserable. Right. <laughs> and, and, you know, would be very critical of the fact that I'm not an orchid person, and I maybe misspelled a Latin term for a particular right. orchid. So 
number one, with, with just the reception among the people who are expert on a topic, you, you just have to brace yourself for inevitable criticism. Right. But the one thing you don't want is to just totally goof and you know miss something. And it's that's just a matter of trying to be diligent and also going to those experts and learning from them and pushing them to make sure that they're teaching you. You know, certainly with the ten year old boy that wasn't the case, but with a lot of these other subjects. There are people who know these subjects backward and forward, and they're not writing about them. And all I can think of is I'm coming in from a whole other perspective, and I'm telling a different kind of story. But you, you certainly don't want to be wrong, and you don't want to, I um, mean, it would be really embarrassing to suddenly you know, have someone call and say, surprise, you completely missed x. Right. Um, you know, I guess the only defense is if you have done what you feel is your due diligence, of course you're going to miss stuff. And if you miss something, you know, appalling, um, I mean, that would be a terrible experience if you simply didn't touch on every detail of something and, and some expert's going to call you on it. I mean. In the case of these ORCID experts, I asked them to fact check certain sections of the book because I thought this way I can give them some sense of ownership right. <laughs> and get them a little bit on my side. I never show them the whole book because that wouldn't be ethical, but I pulled certain sections where I was describing ORCID um, botany. And said, you know, gosh, I don't know anything about orchids. Would you be willing to read this and tell me if I got it right? right. And you know, that helped a little bit. You know, this book about the LA Library. I'm certainly no expert on Los Angeles history. I'm no expert on libraries. So I'm contending with two significant vested parties. And you know, I'm I'm definitely. A, you know, a little anxious about it yeah. because I know that that's just, I'm a generalist. I'm not an expert. I don't pretend to be. And so I feel that I'm particularly vulnerable to that kind of criticism. Yeah. Um, what is your library book about? Tell us about your. Um, it's a book about the Los Angeles Public Library, just its life and times, but particularly about uh, the arson fire there in 1986 that was the largest library uh, fire in the United States. So I'm also dealing with arson fanatics, mm, yeah. by the way. That's, you have a special <laughs> trifecta there. Yeah, well, as a matter of fact, I got out of the blue, I got contacted by a guy who said, well, you know, by the way, you probably don't know me, but I run the arson project, where basically we <laughs> examine all arsons. And then I thought, OK, well. And, but the good thing is that he has been a, turned into a great source and right. really useful. Um, but in, it's a great story, and it's a, you know, also about the life and times of an urban library, which in itself is just sort of fascinating to me. Have you spent the night there? I always imagine that would be like the first thing to do, is just like get a sleeping bag and see what happens in the library at night. I haven't. That's oh. really scary and horrible. <laughs> it sounds um, scary, right? I don't know that it's open to the public for that, right. but I but can maybe look for you because you can. <laughs> I've been there early, and I've been in parts of the library I never dreamed existed. Um, and again, it's one of these nation states where it's just a remarkably complex institution. Mm -hmm. I mean, you think, oh, it's like books on shelves, but of course, it's more than that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> surprise, yeah. and and certainly. Um, you know, it's also uh, a topic that in sort of embraces within it some huge um, public policy issues yeah. that are really important, that libraries are kind of at the forefront, that have nothing to do with books and have to do with being public space. Yeah. So um, gosh, I just had a question that I was going to ask you, and it left my brain. <laughs> um, I wanted to uh, talk a little bit about how 
um, you create, you know, the distinctive voice that your pieces have. Is that something that you are that you've developed over time? And did you see yourself in a certain tradition as you were starting out? You know, were there certain writers that you were emulating? Um, and you know, did you see yourself as part of a you know a particular set? I hugely admire um, the whole canon of of the New Yorkers, um, the writers who, from practically from the beginning of the magazine's history, really amazing, and and also not only wonderful reporting, but um, from almost from the very beginning of the magazine, the sense that stories could be very individual, that they could have voice, that they could include first person without being um, memoir in any way. And I think that that was very influential for me, reading John McPhee, um, A.J. Liebling, Joseph Mitchell, all of the, the whole very long history of New Yorker writers who wrote with a lot of voice. And there's, you would never mistake one of those people's pieces for another. I mean, they're very individual. When I first started writing, I think um, I imitated the writers I admired. And I actually think that's not a bad way to find your way to your own voice, which then ends up you know, it's so funny because you think uh, this sounds just like me. Why was it so hard to get there? But that's that's the strange thing about yeah. about voice, and how how that. I mean, it's so difficult to even put your finger on it. I'm not sure what it is as much as um, you're writing in an authentic way out of the material that you've gathered, and that. There's more and more freedom. I think that's what it is. That over time, I've felt more freedom to write the way I speak, and that that becomes a very natural reflection of something quite personal in tone. Yeah. And you know, then there's. I mean, there's a huge amount of just factual reporting in my stories and my and certainly my books. I mean, a lot of history, a lot of. <laughs> background. Yeah. I think it still is being filtered through the this this sort of narrative voice that I would use if I were telling you these stories out loud. Yeah. And that's a uh, I think that there's some piece of that that's just purely the confidence that you actually know the material and that you can deliver it in, a, in an engaging way. Um, I know that every story that I begin, I think this one's going to be really different. I'm just, it's just not going to sound like all my other stories. It's going to sound really different. And then it ends up sounding the same. Yeah. I, you know, they're all different, of course. But the fact is that it still ends up, I think, sounding like I wrote it. Yeah. And, and that's. Um, for better or worse, I think it means that at least I'm writing truly out of my own voice. Yeah. I don't know how you develop that. I don't. I think it is a matter of experience, of confidence, of feeling that um, you you know you begin by by writing within the template of what you think a story should sound like, and then over time you begin feeling that you can experiment a little and tell it the way you would tell it and yeah. um, take some chances and and not have to and feel comfortable thinking well this is the way you know this is this sounds right to me this sounds the way I would want to tell the story did you grow up in a storytelling home or did you do you have have you had experiences where you did have to tell you know you you either listened to a lot of stories or, or you know, told a lot of them yourself? I think my dad certainly ta told a lot of stories and from the time I was really young I began writing 
and I would write little books about my family's trips, about, you know, I was just always storytelling. And it's not that we would sit around a campfire at night and, and see who could tell a better story, but it felt um, natural to convert experience into story. And to, and, and I think early on, I mean, I think of writing as very performative and that you are in real time engaging with the reader. And so the idea that I could tell any of these stories out loud feels like a good measure of whether the story is working or not. Mm -hmm. That it has to have that, that sense that somebody's listening to you and that you're keeping them engaged. Yeah. Do you find, you know, I, I have sort of two questions about the, the sort of subjects that, you know, when you're dealing with um, sort of ordinary people um, or people who aren't accustomed to having attention paid to them, um, do you find that there's, I'm going to, well, here, I'll drop the Janet Malcolm hammer, <laughs> which is, I know you've thought about this a little bit, um, but she has this great, you know, this great opening to her book, The Journalist and the Murderer, which says, um, every journalist who is not too stupid or too full of himself to notice what is going on knows that what he does is morally indefensible. He is a kind of confidence man preying on people's vanity, ignorance, or loneliness, gaining their trust and betraying them without remorse. <laughs> and so I think that that's, I think about that all the time, you yeah. know, just as sort of, it's a, like an unavoidable part of the process, right? Because you are taking something from someone and right. using it for your own ends. But I think it can be even tougher to negotiate that with people who are less aware of what's oh, happening. Absolutely. Um, absolutely. So how do you think about that? Or how do you work out that relationship? Um, yeah, and also, in addition to what you just said, people who stand to gain nothing right. by it. I mean, if you're writing about a celebrity, what they gain is, you know, free city. Yeah. press. And so they are getting something. And I, I don't know if this has happened to you, but it's happened to me a number of times where people in total, you know, there's, there's nothing shocking about it, but they will say, what are you going to pay me um, to talk to you? And, you know, I actually sometimes think, you know what? It's not so crazy. That would to be think more fair in a way. Yeah. That you, you know, it's a reasonable question. Except I always say uh, nothing actually because I just, I I can't. It wouldn't be right. But knowing that they could say, why wouldn't it be right? You're I'm telling you my story and you're getting paid to write it. Right. And my argument has always been I I think you'll enjoy having this written, which is also not always true either. Yeah. Um, it's a really difficult and constant part of being a journalist. And you know, as much as that Janet Malcolm statement seems harsh, I think it's 100% true yeah. um, that we, we are asking people to give us something, namely their confidence, their time, their vulnerability. And it's, a, it's very complicated. Writing about kids really brings that home to you. Yeah. Because when I finished my reporting about Colin Duffy, and I'd spent every minute with him and was sort of his best friend for this stretch of time, and we had come to the point where I now had one week to write this story. And I was like, I am out of here. I've got to now go and write. And he said to me, are you coming to school on Monday? I think it was a Friday. He said, are you going to come to school on Monday? And I said, no. So I was thinking, are you kidding? I've got to write my story now. And he was clearly wounded. And I thought, oh my god, you know? I have been his best pal. We've had all this fun together. Um, I and this is the other part of it. As a journalist, you are you're like a therapist. You listen and ask for no listening in return. So what could be better? Yeah. You're the perfect friend. And in this case, 
just seeing that look on his face of, I don't understand. That why. was real to him, that relationship. Yeah, had, and now yeah. you're not coming back. And the fact is that that's, been tr that's true in every story I've ever written to a greater or lesser degree, but certainly with some people that feeling is, well, you know, now you're leaving. And, and also the fact is you have to steal yourself because you know that they may not love the story and yeah. that um, there may be hurt feelings. And um, if you can't do that, then you can't be a journalist. And that is not a pleasant experience. I mean, you know, when I wrote, you read the lead for that Tanya Harding story, and you know, I spent this time with the Tanya Harding fan club, and this was when Tanya Harding was not in her highest moment in our history. And they let me sit in with the fan club, and I think they thought this was going to be a story about how Tanya had been misunderstood and mm -hmm. that she was not she was being blamed for this attack on Nancy Kerrigan and it was wrong, it was unfair. And the piece was not critical of them or particularly critical of Tanya Harding, but they were devastated oh, wow. and angry and hurt. And it was really hard for me yeah. to just take a deep breath and think, you know, I'm, I didn't do this for them to like me, but mm -hmm. I hoped that they would appreciate what the story was about, yeah. but the fact is, they weren't going to. Yeah. I I don't think there's a solution for that. And yeah. certain stories, where the people are, I'll give you even a better example, which was some years ago when after the John Benet Ramsey murder, and there was so much discussion about children's beauty pageants, and you know instant. Um, assumption that they were just nightmarish and horrible. And I thought, you know what? I don't know a thing about ch children's beauty pageants. And even though my gut feeling is that they're repugnant, my whole position as a journalist is it's really wrong to make a decision about something you know nothing about. So I'm going to go and try to learn about children's beauty pageants and see if I can understand what motivates people particularly because it's something that I find so sort of superficially so distasteful. Yeah. So I went down to Tennessee and I spent time with um, a woman who runs some of the beauty pageants. And you know, on one hand I thought, well, I'm safe in the sense that she and none of her friends read The New Yorker. So <laughs> you know, the chance of her friends coming to her and saying, oh my god, I, that piece was awful, you know, there was a little bit less of that, seriously, because yeah. I thought, chances are they're not necessarily going to ever see it. Yeah. At the same time, I thought, all I can do is try to truly be open and really let her speak her piece and really see this with as open a mind as I can to understand why these people who are perfectly nice people would be doing something that I find so creepy. Yeah. And to write it with as much heart as I could, even knowing that at the end of the day, it wasn't going to be like, wow, beauty pageants for infants are really awesome. Right. Um, but to try to say there are reasons people do this. Yeah. And, and that they would feel that they got a fair hearing. Do people always react that way? No. I mean, of course not. Yeah. I, a lot of people are just, their feeling is, you know, that they're being made fun of or they're being criticized. Although what I really hope, and I take a lot of pride in that, I don't feel that I'm condescending to the people I write about. Yeah. And I write about people from many different social and economic strata, and I, I feel truly that I can do it very comfortably, and I don't feel judgmental. But the fact is something in print, particularly for the readership that's going to be reading it, is not always going to please those people yeah. that I write about. And no matter, even if it's totally complimentary, being written about is really hard and yeah. really uncomfortable for people. And 
I feel like every journalist should be written about at least once to see so how get uncomfortable a taste of their own medicine. Oh my God, it's <laughs> awful. I mean, nobody reacts as badly as, um, you know, I mean, the first time someone wrote something about me, I was like, what? Are you kidding? You know, made some comment about how I took off some sunglasses and I thought, I did not take off my sunglasses. Right. I don't do that. You know, and so it's just, it's probably a good experience to be reminded of how powerful it is to be written about yeah. and how uncomfortable it, and how you have to do it if you're writing especially about people who stand to gain nothing from it with a certain amount of, of compassion. Mm -hmm. I wanna ask one more question and then make sure everybody else has time to ask okay. their questions, but um, I also wondered, you know, because you're writing about you know, ordinary people and you're doing it with a sense of humor, <laughs> Um, you know, it's not breaking news, um, and you're also a woman, which we now know is the kiss of death, if you want to be a journalist, <laughs> um, from the, the gay to lease discussion that we had. So I wondered if you've ever, I mean, have you had to push against, um, have you had to push to be taken seriously as a journalist, you know, because of the kinds of things that you write about and the way in which um, you approach those subjects? Do you feel like that's been a, a difficulty for you over the course of your career? Well, it's certainly the case that the, the kind of subjects that I'm really interested in are not, um, they're not going to feel urgent. And they're, you know, I remember um, some time ago feeling like I'll never get a job because no one ever is going to say, we really need someone to write about children's beauty pageants and we've got to fill that job. Right. You know, <laughs> it's, um, it's my, I made my bed, I'm lying in it, and I'm very happy and I feel incredibly lucky to be doing what I'm doing. And I actually believe really passionately that there's an enormous importance to reminding people that the world around them is filled with mystery, that ordinariness is, um, is complex, and that, they're, that learning about the world around you, even in its, its most commonplace manifestations, is, is valuable. So I feel really strongly, and I feel th I have a really strong sense of mission in, in what I do, you know, to a point of feeling really quite passionate about it. Does that instantly seem important? I mean, and it's something that I've actually, even at The New Yorker, which has been so supportive of me, um, you know, to say I want 15,000 words for a story about grocery stores right. is sometimes a, harder to navigate because the argument can be, but you could do a really good 8,000 words on grocery stores and we need 15,000 words about the Taliban. Right. And it's hard to argue with that. Yeah. And that's where books, you know, there's a great advantage with doing a book where you can say, well, I'm I can write about what I want to write about in a book. I would never say that I don't feel that it's taken seriously, but I, I still feel like um, it, it's, it's striking a different note. And I feel that The New Yorker really respects that and has supported it and has a long tradition of these kinds of stories. I think, though, um, I'm aware that these are slight in concept and that that's always the challenge. The, the concept may be slight, so the execution has to be powerful. And so that puts it on me to make the argument that, sure, this is a, you know, on paper seems, I would never say, um, trivial because I, I don't think it's ever treated that way. But these are stories that at first glance seem more minor than stories that have drama associated with them. Yeah. And I will say, just to back up, 
because I, I feel like this is worth saying, I think it's a huge advantage to be a woman journalist. Yeah. And that it's, um, I think, you know, just as long as we're going to paint with a broad brush, I think women have the advantage of learning, uh, you know, in general, being able to immerse themselves in wor worlds in some ways more easily and being that there is a way that I think it's easier for women to say I'm going to sort of blend into this world and listen and you don't enter the world and already have a kind of adversarial role and you know I don't want to this sounds totally sexist to say it, but I think it's very easy for me to go into these worlds and say, I really am not an expert, and I'd like you to teach me. And I'm not sure, I think men have sometimes a harder time doing that. Yeah. Yeah. That's my sexist That's statement. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, all right, well, I, does, do people have questions that they? I'm Betsy O'Donovan. I was a fellow in 2013, um, and I love your work. Thank you. Um, and I think part of it is this extraordinary wonder in the ordinary that you've talked about. My question is, because you see that wonder in the ordinary, not where do you find your ideas, but how do you prune them? How do you distill things into something that makes the kinds of stories you write? In terms of choosing story ideas or Right. Well, you know, since I spend a lot of my time going, oh my God, how interesting. And then I often have to say, like, not everything is a story. Um, and that that can be tricky because I have to sort of um, filter my own impulses to think this one, yes, I'm interested in this, but I don't see an arc here that could be a story. It's largely in intuition. Um, you know, sometimes I think the important thing is to feel what I generally do is I push something out of my head. If it keeps coming back and coming back, then I think, all right, this is one I, I'm, I've got to do. I've got to do. I mean, sometimes some stories instantly strike me where you know, I, one day I saw a taxidermy catalog, and I thought, oh my god, a taxidermy catalog, that's so weird. And, you know, I Googled taxidermy and saw that the World Taxidermy Championships were coming up, and I thought, I have to do this. So, you know, there are times when certain things just instantly happen that way. But the, the way I am in the world is there so often I have an idea, I mean, I'm just curious about something, and my instinct is always to think, oh, that's a great story. And often I think, just wait and see if it keeps coming back and see if it feels like there's some path to follow. Um, and you know, generally, it just is going purely on gut to say, I think there's more I want to learn. I just want to know. And Monica? Yeah. Um, thank you so much, Monica. Hi, I'm Monica. I'm a current Neiman Fellow. You were talking about when the concept is slight, the execution has to be very strong, but also the power of looking more deeply into ordinary stories. It's such a great way to tell a story, but in a way, it, it, it requires a lot of trust from the editor that the reporter can actually execute as well as needs right. to be executed. So can you reflect on what story in your career was the first proof that you could execute that well that began opening those doors for you? Um, that's a really good question because you're absolutely right that you know you need an editor who's willing because I I am the worst proposal writer, the worst story pitcher in the world because most of these begin by me thinking I just want to know more. I don't know what's out there and I don't want to do the reporting 
I don't want to write an extensive proposal. I want you to support me to go forward and learn. And that means some <laughs> editor, yeah, I mean, some editor has to say, OK. Um, I actually do feel that The New Yorker was really the place where I was given that permission. Although, I actually did a column for the Bus in Phoenix, and then another column for the um, Globe Sunday Magazine, where in both cases I had editors who were really willing to let me try these things and, and to go on stories that on first glance don't sound like stories. But it was when I got to The New Yorker, and it was almost like this perfect fit where I, I had these ideas that I really, really wanted to find out about these worlds that I was curious about. And they were willing to say, go find out. And I didn't need to say, here's the way the story will play out. But I also think that you need to start being able to show it. And one, you know, for me, one of the ways it really worked was doing Talk of the Town pieces. And those were short enough that you know, they, the, the commitment was minimal. And I could take these little ideas. I mean, sometimes they were so small. I mean, I remember walking around one day and seeing a sign that said Modern Supply Company. It was the most old fashioned, funky sign. And I thought, God, this is <laughs> like a visual sort of, you know, made no sense, this modern supply <laughs> company. And I thought, there's a story in there. And being starting to do those kind of pieces regularly, those I'm just curious kind of stories, um, and being able to pull them off led to me you know, having an editor who was willing to say, OK, go try something bigger. And my first New Yorker piece, my first New Yorker feature was basically started as a talk of the town piece. I don't remember how I even learned about this, but I, I think I saw a little tiny thing in the newspaper saying that there was a coronation um, for the king of the Ashanti people in the United States. And the king who was being coronated happened to be a cab driver. And I thought, that's a great story. And so I went to meet him. And um, it was going to be a talk of the town piece, but it was such a wonderful story that I said, I really feel to do this justice, it should be a feature. It should be fully fleshed out. And the story was just the particular life of, of this wonderful man who was driving cabs by day and being the king of his people by night. <laughs> and um, that, you know, a lot of editors might say, mm, I don't know. But I think because I, I really, really believed I could pull it off, and my editor was willing to give it a try. And, and then, you know, as you begin building a portfolio of those stories, you get the confidence and you get the editor's confidence to let you try those kind of pieces. Sort of chicken and egg, obviously. But I think the better way to approach it is, Start small. Um, do those pieces where you can show that your execution of the piece can hold up. And, and then eventually, you, you build enough equity with an editor who will then say, OK, try something longer. Yeah. All right, thank you very much. Uh, Dolores Johnson is my name. My question is, uh, after you have um, drafted your piece and you've got your arc the way you want it, what are your major concerns when you revise? Number one is structure. And I think structure is one of those miserable things um, that you know, no matter how many pieces you write, it's still the biggest challenge, which is how do you build literally the the sort of floor plan of this piece what you know what do you tell up front how do you weave together all the pieces of material that you've got and and that's the thing that 
I think an editor, I really am lucky that I've had editors who are really good with structure. I feel like I'm very good at revising my own sentences and I'm really, really good at the flow of a story and the, the sound of a story, but structure is really challenging. And structure and logic, you know, in a point where somebody, another person can read it and say, this isn't making sense. I mean, you need to move this forward so it makes some sense. And that's really hard. And because each story is entirely different, in a way it feels like you never learn, that it's not something that, I feel like you can always get better with writing sentences and description and dialogue, and you, you can sort of always be working on those, but structure each story, it's, you're starting from zero, and each one has its own considerations, and it's really tricky. I had the worst time, um, just to give you an example of, I wrote a story, it's a, a story that was so complicated it was hard to even explain to people what it was. It was about this um, performance art Twitter account called Horse Ebooks. And part of the problem was that I had to begin by explaining to people what Twitter was, what bots are, what performance art is, what, you know, I mean, it was something where I thought, I can't do this, I can't figure out how to structure the story because I have so many things I need to explain before I can even tell you what the story is. And that was really hugely difficult and I revised the structure of the piece many times till I, I don't know if I ever got it right, but it got published. So let's say I, <laughs> I revised it many times and then it got published. Hello, uh, my name is Mary Meehan. I'm a Neiman this year from Kentucky. Uh, and for some reason, that makes my fellow Neimans laugh. I don't know why. Uh, and taxidermy the convention. Oh. Yeah, I am in. We'll go together. Um, the best, the most fun. Yeah. Uh, my question for you is about um, are there some interviewing uh, techniques that you really like to rely on? Are there certain questions that you um, always try to ask? And are there certain parts when you're hanging out with people and you say you're hanging out all day that you find especially especially fruitful or does that um, vary? Yeah, well, the first thing is, um, I, in as much as it is possible, I like to start by spending a lot of time with people without asking any questions. I think there's no faster way to alienate people or just make them uncomfortable than to whip out a notebook with a, a list of questions. So if I can spend time with people where I'm literally not asking questions, and for that matter, usually not even taking notes. The second thing that I have found really helpful is to spend time with people when they're doing something, and not necessarily the thing that I'm writing about. Um, I love doing errands with people. And I know that sounds funny, but the way, you know, I think when you think about a story, what you're trying to do is recreate a certain portion of real life. So real life is not a Q&A face-to-face interview. That's the most unreal. It doesn't represent what, how any of us live. So instead, if you can have real life with the people you're writing about, it's so much better. And I really feel like I've come to know people and know the subjects I'm writing about far better in that time when we are doing something that's off topic. Um, I also think people tend to talk more openly when they don't think they're being interviewed. I'm not obsessive about taking notes. I feel like what we've all tended to forget is the more important thing is to actually listen and pay attention and use your notes more as a reminder when you sit down later for typing up your notes, but to really be listening and, and to let the conversation, I mean, ultimately you wanna to get to know the people you're writing about and the way you get to know them is not in an interview. I mean, I'm thinking about 
I traveled with this gospel group down south for a couple of weeks. And, you know, it was a great experience. It was actually one of the best experiences I ever had working on a story. And I think often of a day when they were not performing and they were back at home and the lead singer of the group I said, what are you up to today? He said, well, and this is sort of funny because it had to do with taxidermy. He said, I had shot a bobcat when I was hunting and the taxidermist called and said it was ready. And I'm going to go pick it up, but it's about an hour away. And I said, oh, well, can I come? And he said, well, yeah, sure, if you want. And so I sat with him and we drove to the taxidermist. And by the way, this is another thing that has been proven repeatedly, is sitting side by side with people is so much more intimate than face to face. So if you can do anything where you're side by side with the people you're writing about, it's totally different. Sitting in a car, perfect. Hanging out at a taxidermist, perfect. Not always an option, but if it is, <laughs> grab it. <laughs> But, you know, in the course of driving across uh, Mississippi to go get his bobcat, you know, I felt like I got to know him in a way. I, don't, I didn't take a single note. It wasn't about that. The fact is the piece stands or falls by the, the ability of the writer to say to you, I met someone really interesting. I want to tell you about them. And in real life, I should be able to tell that to you. It's not about the quotes. It's not about my notes. It's about the fact that I really got to know someone really interesting whose life to me was fascinating. And it's that I observed that life. So I'm, I'm not a good, you know, if I'm told you have an hour, I'm in a panic because that's not, although my funniest hour with anybody was, <laughs> I was, I did a profile of Thomas Kincaid, the painter of light. Surely you all have collected his work. I, I did a story with Bob Ross. Oh, all right. Well, same thing. So Thomas Kincaid, who sadly has left our planet and is now on his own planet, um, I was told he would give me one hour. And I, I walked into his studio. He pulled out a tape recorder and said, I'm going to be taping you. And he had like a timer. And I thought, I'm going to fall apart. This is not the way I do my stories. I mean, but then I thought, you know, this is so revealing. This is so perfect that this is a guy who's controlling every aspect of his life and even the interview, everything. And then he, he let me stay a little more than an hour. I will also say when I walked in, because I thought, this guy's such a hick. I can't believe it. I walked in and he said, I really like what David Remnick's doing with The New Yorker. And I thought, OK, yeah. there you go. I am totally wrong right off the bat. And you know, it, but I'm, I get nervous if I'm told I have a set amount of time, because that's not the way I generally do best with these stories. But then when I have to, I then just sort of go into overdrive and think, all right, I have to collect every bit of marginalia in this experience, so the, the conversation is one thing, but I have to be trying to gather as much around this as I possibly can. And I have done a number of stories where I was told, you have an hour um, or you know, a limited amount of time. So not everything I've written involved months of you know, sleeping on someone's couch. There are many stories where I was given a very limited amount of time, and I just had to try to make it feel real. We've got time for one more, maybe. Hamish. My name's Hamish. I'm a Neiman Fellow. One of the uh, things we're asked to consider uh, in our Neiman year is why do I do what I do? So I wonder why you do what you do. Is there a grander purpose? Um, what does the cumulative impact of your work mean? Um, I actually do feel that there's a grander purpose. And, and it's like a stealth mission. When I wrote The Orchid Thief, I knew that orchid fanatics would read the book. 
But I had a lot of people come up to me and say, I cannot believe I just read a book about orchids. And I said, I can't believe I wrote a book about orchids. So <laughs> we're kind of on the same plane. But for me, what was amazing and what, you know, what was gratifying and what matters to me is these people said, you know, many of them were people who had either been to Florida and had no idea that Florida was anything other than the resorts on the beach. Or, you know, in some cases they said, I know this is crazy, but my husband and I went to the Fakahatchee. And the idea that it opened their eyes to something they would never have considered, that they never thought about, that they never valued, and that in a way that it might make them live their life differently. And I know that sounds very grand, but I think once you say to people, you are capable of being surprised, you're capable of appreciating the world, and in particular, you're capable of feeling some connection or empathy for people who are very much not like you, it seems like that's really worth it. And it seems, you know, I don't want to make it sound too grand, but I, I really feel like there, that's a huge loss that we've all felt, which is an inability to be open to something strange, something different, something outside our, our purview. And that, as a writer, if I made someone think not only that they could read about something they didn't think they'd be interested in, but maybe even that they then, on their own, can be interested in something they didn't think initially they could be engaged with, then it's worth it. I think that's it. So thank you. <laughs>